Good evening. My name is Anja Bakiewicz. I am the Women in Sports Coordinator uh, in Mountain Dewing Island. I would like to welcome everybody in the fifth uh, class of the Mountaineering Island Women um, Female Master Classes. Uh, I'm absolutely honored uh, to have Claire tonight as a guest. Uh, Claire is the one of the most accomplished Irish climbers. Um, she's the Irish climber, she's the female uh, Irish climber. I know the most of you knows Claire uh, very well and uh, knows her uh, massive contribution to Irish uh, mountaineering. But uh, for those that doesn't know Claire, I would like to say that uh, Claire has been climbing for six years and she has been climbing uh, in Ireland, uh, developing loads of uh, routes, contributing to many uh, climbing guidebooks, um, being on many committees, writing um, articles, but also climbing in Alps, Himalayas and America, or Americas, Claire, uh, you can correct me. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm delighted to have Claire. Uh, I invited Claire uh, to the first master class that's supposed to happen in April, I think. But because of the pandemic, we have to postpone uh, the interview. And I'm delighted, Claire, to have you here. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anya. It's a pleasure to be here. Lovely. Yeah. Um, so glad as well and welcome everybody as well. Um, I'm so happy that everybody could uh, make it. Uh, I hope you have plenty of questions uh, to Claire. Um, the format of the meeting is uh, very simple. I would like to ask you to ask Claire questions. Uh, at the bottom uh, of the screen, you can see a little icon chat. Please put your um, messages to Claire or questions to Claire into it. Um, you can start now. And mm -hmm. I think without a further ado, I'm going to start uh, the question. You ready, Claire? Sure. Okay, lovely. Um, okay, first question. Why do you climb? Oh, because, <clears throat> because it's fun. It's exciting. And it makes you feel really glad to be alive. So that's very precious. I think anybody who has something like that in their life, in their life, really values it. And I certainly do. How often do you climb or train? Well, it very much depends on the time of year. If <clears throat> If it's winter and we're, we're not away somewhere, then we'd get to the climbing wall two or three times a week. And then say we, say we got there twice a week, then on two other days, I would do some, we would both do some training at home, some strength and conditioning training. So if there were nothing to upset the routine, I suppose we could say two days climbing and two days with some training. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer, um, well, it's very weather dependent and it's hard to keep a routine as anybody knows climbing in Ireland anyway. We're obsessive about weather forecasts. Yeah. And uh, if, we, if we go away in Ireland to climb at the weekend, then we might just get to the climbing wall one day in the week apart from that. Mm -hmm. And just following that question from Patrina about um, training, do you train differently now than when you trained when you were younger or in your 20s or 30s? Yeah, yes, very differently. I only started properly training two years ago. Oh, I think, right. I think it would have made a big difference if I had trained a lot when I was a lot younger. But training just wasn't acceptable then in the 70s. It, it really, if people trained, they kept it secret. It was considered cheating, bad form. It was, mm -hmm. it was um, skill and courage, natural talent. 
that made a good climber, not doing press ups and pull ups. So, well, climbing walls, climbing walls got going around um, the mid to late eighties, very, very primitive climbing walls. And once a few of those opened in Dublin, we started training on climbing walls, but for more specific, no, specific is the wrong word, but for, from, for non-wall climbing training, I never did that in any sort of disciplined way until about two years ago. And it's been great. I've noticed a difference. Yeah. Okay. And would you have like um, a climbing specific uh, or nutrition um, tips for women or men in, okay, in their Yep. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure most most other people know way more about all of that than I do. I, I don't look into that side of it at all. Um, no, no, definitely not. I, we, we, we just eat a good varied diet and potatoes. I love potatoes. I can't <laughs> believe that anybody would give up eating potatoes. <laughs> energy. Yeah, pure energy, I guess. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So from Helen, uh, ooh, no, Katrina, are non-climbers surprised when you tell them about your hobby? Well, yeah, yes, and they, they would usually presume that I mean hill walking anyway. And uh, yeah, if, 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 they, if, if it happened to come out that I, you know, that I was actually rock climbing or ice climbing, Yes, they, they are surprised, I must say, particularly that somebody of my age would still be active. That's an extra surprise, usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think it comes with the perception of women as well in sports, um, especially I think in Ireland, uh, women are not uh, perceived as uh, at least maybe fully uh, or maybe Ireland it's uh, um, well different kind of sports or disciplines are uh, connected with being an athlete but rock climbing is still growing as a discipline and I can imagine if you say that you are a rock climber and you perform for 50 years that must have been a huge impression um, yeah well Certainly, I mean, climbing when I started was was an invisible sport. It, it really wasn't known in Ireland at all. But I think things are so different now. And I think people do have access to, young women, girls do have access to, they have an introduction to climbing walls if they're lucky uh, through school. Um, so, but, but you're right, it's still, it's still very much a minority activity. So I think anything that can be done, and I know a lot is being done to uh, bring it to a more general level of awareness. I think that's great. When I see young kids at the climbing wall, how enthusiastic they are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's really great and totally different to what I experienced when I started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was your experience? if I may just follow the thread. Well, well it was um, ha having joined the Mountaineering Club in UCD and it was a very good club um, and organized regular hill walks. And we joined my sister and I and uh, well, yeah, we got to know a lot of people. We joined in the autumn as you do back to college after the summer. And then uh, in the spring, people talked about rock climbing, but one of the, older postgraduate club members, uh, a, a young woman said, oh no, um, you guys shouldn't be thinking of that. That's, that's not for girls. Rock climbing, that's not for girls. But we, we were dying to do it, a group of us, and um, we were introduced to it in Jockey Quarry and we, mm -hmm. we just loved it because it was totally different to anything we had experienced before. And we had done sports the typical mainstream sports like hockey and tennis and that at school, but climbing was completely different. It 
didn't seem to have rules. It was really exciting from the word go. It had its own vocabulary. It, it was just such a different way of using, using our bodies, just so exciting that we, we became really interested from the beginning. Yeah, that was, that was 1971. And at, at the time, uh, there, there were the standard team sports in Ireland, but um, at that time, uh, the first woman hadn't yet got to the summit of Everest and women were not yet allowed to run in marathons. And there was, there were, there was a really a closed attitude to sport. It, team, team games, team sports were really all that it was about. And most girls and young women didn't continue any of that after school. So. I want to ask, what's your favorite route that you have put up in her head? Um, my, my favorite, I, pr probably when I put up three or four years ago, uh, Abyssinia, because, mm -hmm. because I barely got up it. Uh, Calvin did the first pitch and I thought that was quite hard and but I had cleaned the route and I was concentrating on the second pitch because I knew it was a really good line and I knew there was a crack breaking through some really bulgy rock and that the crack continued and continued and I knew I'd be able to get gear in because you can with a crack mm -hmm. yeah. so I thought yeah, and maybe there'll be some hand jams, which I like if they're the yeah. right size. And, um, but the pitch was actually really sustained and I just about hung in there and, and got up to the ledge on the top. And so, so I, I was really pleased with that. Um, it, it, it wasn't perhaps the hardest or the most classic climb that I've put up, but uh, I remember every move on that pitch. And near the top, I thought, oh, I, just, I just haven't got the energy to keep going. But R Ricky Bell was around that day and he was on an abro and he decided just at short notice to, to, to film me climbing. Mm -hmm. And he was really encouraging. And I must say, that was a help just to struggle on the last, few, yeah. the last meter or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does help, yes, yeah, when there is somebody who's encouraging you. I think that's the, the nice thing about climbing and uh, the climbing society. People are so open and encouraging. That's true. Yeah. That's true, because Calvin was feeling way, way below, completely out of sight. And, yeah. Yeah, to have a bit of company was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, next question. We have 14 more questions, so I'm going to just fire through it okay. and see what happens. Um, what advice do you have for older climbers in terms of exercise and keeping in good shape? We kind of... Kind of, kind of, but I think as we probably all learned with the lockdown, the thing is to keep it up regularly, especially when you're getting a bit older. You, you, and any, any time you take away from it, you've got to give yourself a bit of time to get back into it not just physically but psychologically particularly if your thing is trad climbing so i suppose the main thing is just to keep at it mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. question from jane when you were writing your book did you write a lot from your memory or did you use diaries uh, I, use, I use diaries. I've, I've, all, I've kept a diary for since I was 12. And when I, when I retired from teaching, I, for the first time, had a chance, I had time to reread all the diaries. And, uh, they, and, and not only diaries, but, but letters as well, which really are a thing of the past. But because when, from when I was old enough, when I was 16 or so, because I traveled a lot, I, I wrote home to my parents and they kept most of the letters and some of them were 12, 14, 15 pages long. And I, I looked back at those and then there were lots of letters that people sent me and sent Calvin and letters we sent to each other. 
uh, when Calvin was away on big trips. So all of that gave a great deal of the feel of the times. And it, it, it was very interesting for me to read through it all from the beginning, the diaries and the letters, and see how different things were then, were in, in, the, in the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, what, what we thought, what people's attitudes were, what the particular little day-to-day -day problems were that needed to be solved, just general life problems and mm -hmm. climbing things. And I have a note of probably every climb I ever did with the name and the grade. Of course, with, with the sport climbs, it would be just the grade, but um, put rereading it, I could see um, I could see the shape. I could see sort of themes, if you like, and that was really useful when I started to write the book. Mm -hmm. But my idea of writing the book actually was to write Calvin's biography. But once I got started, the flow of the writing went much better if I did it from my point of view. Yeah. So. His story is in there as well, but from my point of view. Yeah, well, I'm glad about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's a very uh, interesting question about your memories and uh, keeping diary, because I know that loads of climbers, they keep a diary and they keep a diary of their performance and they go back to it to check and it's a great, mm. uh, great place to kind of monitor it yourself and then the memories and yeah because I I actually noticed as well there was a great there is a great deal of detail uh, in the book as well and I was thinking myself like how do you remember all of this mm -hmm. how do you remember what Calvin said at that time or what other people said like I wrote it down <laughs> yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. question from Josie so Josie asks what uh, what's the thought process you have before starting a new route? Oh, well, there's no denying that when you've spent a week maybe on an absolute rope cleaning a section of rock, say at Fairhead, you have a fair idea of the rough layout of the climb. Uh, we would never practice anything on top rope, so you wouldn't know the handholds and what gear would go in but you'd have it in your mind that you think maybe the crooks is going to be up at that section or uh, maybe it's the start that is the most difficult and you say to yourself okay manage that to the best of my ability and then you'll get a breather on that ledge so really I suppose when you're starting it's it's just I don't have any sort of psychological rituals or anything like that. Um, I, it's, it's, it's always, you just feel very optimistic that uh, it's, it's, you're going to be able to do it, that it's going to work out and um, look forward to the discovery in it. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, that's about it, yeah. Mm, yeah, it is interesting because these days, um, many people, uh, they rehearse uh, their climb mm -hmm. before they attempt to actually do the first uh, ascent. Um, have you ever done it? No, no. M maybe if I were 20 now and, and back at that stage again, I would because um, people obviously p really push their grade and climb very hard stuff by, by head pointing. But for me, for both of us, that seems almost like not quite trad climbing, it's almost like a hybrid. It's it's a style of climbing which is, I think, very influenced by sport climbing that you would practice and practice uh, on a top rope and perhaps put the gear in in advance and clip as you go. Um, it's just not a style that has ever appealed to me. Um, I, think, I, I think the on-site lead from the ground up without free practice, without hanging on gear. I think that's the most psychologically demanding style of climbing. 
And for me, that's the most satisfying. And I'm very happy to stick with that style. I, I think too, I mean, the, the um, head pointing, the pre-practice started and is very understandable with very hard routes. I mean, nobody wants to go onto a death route and yeah. not know what they're dealing with, with bad gear or no gear. But it has come right down through the grades. And I think some people starting climbing now take it almost as that's what you do. That you, if you're moving up to a higher grade, that you practice, that you check it all out. I think that's that. I think that's a shame, really. I think people should give themselves a chance for the full experience of the the on-site lead. Um, I mean, nobody should feel forced, obviously, to completely stick their neck out. But it, it's it takes from the ascent of a climb if you don't take the chance of tackling it as an on-site. And um, I think people rob themselves of the real experience if they feel they have to pre-practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting, interesting. How did you get into climbing? Um, well, it, it came from an interest in, in hill walking. My father used to bring us hill walking in West Cork as children and being out in the mountains, being out in the wild, having those beautiful landscapes and having the memory of them afterwards really made an impression on me, um, especially as I had started, he had started, my father had started bringing us hill walking a couple of years before I went away to, to boarding school. So we had that experience, my sister and I, and then we were five years in the convent boarding school where only during the holidays did we have access to anything adventurous. And I think that made it all the more precious. So in then after school, when I went to UCD uh, and joined the Mountaineering Club uh, and went hill walking in Wicklow, it, it, um, it was great. It was, it, was a, um, it was the highlight of our week to go out on the club bus to Wicklow with maybe 40 or 50 other young people. And we made great friendships within that group. And then the climbing came out of that, that uh, one of the more experienced club members brought a group of us climbing in Dorky and we learned the basics. And then uh, there's a group of us girls who uh, once we learned to belay, we used to come out just in twos and threes ourselves and climb regularly. And then moving to more demanding climbing, um, there was a very, an informal apprenticeship system then. The system is even too formal a word, but the typical thing was that as an inexperienced climber, you kind of attached yourself to somebody more experienced. Mm -hmm. You became their climbing partner. Uh, you might be their second for a while, but then you'd lead stuff yourself. So you picked up the, the, the terminology, the skills, to climb harder climbs, to tackle multi-pitch climbs in Glendalock. And now this was really before, yeah, it was definitely before uh, climbing instruction got going. And I would have been one of the very earliest climbing instructors. Mm -hmm. So that was just on a voluntary basis. So it was it was very different then. Uh, there, there was there was always the possibility of just picking up the skills as you went along from other people. And that's yeah. what we did. Interesting question from Oshin. Given the amount of development on the island over the last 50 years, do you think that the opportunity for true climbing adventure has diminished? Is climbing becoming sanitized in your view? Um, yeah, yes and no. Um, uh, well, let's just think of the first part of that. I think there's still lots of opportunity for mm. adventurous climbing and climbing development in Ireland. There's still loads of new routes to be done at Fairhead. You just need to put the time in to do them. Um, and in Donegal, uh, and there are coastal cliffs in Mayo and Donegal that definitely there is still, there's still more development to be done. Um, in terms of climbing becoming sanitized, the extent to which 
climbing is becoming more mainstream, there are, yes, there's a tendency for it to become more sanitized because uh, people who are introduced to climbing and who um, at, at, at in, indoor walls, they, their natural, their, their inclination if they go outdoors is to look around and see and say, well, well, well where are the boats in places like Jockey Quarry? So mm -hmm. since there aren't boats, they, the tendency seems to be to, to top rope. And that's a type of sanitizing. That's, that's, making, that's making it safe. And I would feel that a core element of climbing is that there is a certain amount of risk and you deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a tendency to sanitize uh, and I, I, I hope it won't take from the experience for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a really interesting uh, question these days because people have a um, different kind of uh, approach to climbing and yeah. then training as well and then performing and yes. I think it's I think it's a time for another this would be a, a good topic for another conversation. Uh, today we are just touching um, a yeah. lot of questions, yes, but I think it is a really interesting question, definitely. And 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 yeah, sorry, just before we leave that, I think too, with with the with climbing coming into the Olympics, it it um, it really emphasizes the the competition, the indoor wall side of it. Mm -hmm. But if in very general terms, if you were to compare the climbing experience of indoor wall climbers who really compete at a high level and trad climbers, it's almost like comparing um, uh, as, uh, swimmers in a swimming pool compared to people who engage in wild swimming. Yeah. They, they diverge, they diverge hugely as aspects of the sport and very, very different skills are required for each. And of course, the records are going to be made in the pool, of course. Yes. Yeah. But yeah. there should be room for everyone and every for everyone. experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a different discipline, really. It is. Really. Stage. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is. And, and yeah. they're diverging more and more mm -hmm. each year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, another aspect to um, to talk about. Question from Colette. What's your secret to avoiding injuries? Oh, I, well, I, I suppose I'm cautious. Um, I, I, I think... Now I've, I've, I've had a few falls, had a couple of falls this year, had a couple of falls last year on new routes at Fairhead. I was lucky not to hurt myself. I, well, I had gear in, but I just, I just ended up a bit bruised. Um, mm -hmm. I think the likelihood with a lot of climbers now, and I would include myself with that, is you're perhaps more likely to be injured over training uh, at, climbing, at the climbing wall. Um, some kind of repetitive stress injury than perhaps outdoors. And that I've, like a lot of people, I've had to deal with injuries over the last number of years that have just been overuse mm -hmm. injuries. And uh, I have to persuade myself to, when I've been to the physio, to do the rehab exercises. I don't know if anybody else falls into this psychological trap, but uh, I, I have an injury, I ignore it, and then it just becomes too niggling. I go to the physio, I get advice, I get the exercises, I've made the effort, I've paid my money, I've downloaded the exercises, that box is ticked. <laughs> and I don't you don't do them. Exercises. So whatever about avoiding injury, that's hard to do, but, but do the rehab, that's definitely the answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think many people are guilty of that. I would be one of them as well. Just no patience and just the will to climb uh, once you get better. Question from you. Have you had many injuries over the years? Are you ever afraid of falling on climbs? Yeah, this comes with the fear of falling. This one is interesting. It's all right, yeah. No, I have a very healthy feel of fear of falling. Even on sport routes, I hate falling. I, 
I even on the climbing wall, I hate falling, and I've never, I've never trained myself to do practice falls to get over the psychological shock of it. No, um, it's something you just have to live with, really. And when you're trail climbing, just to place the gear when you can and remind yourself that it's good and just go for it over the next few moves. I, I'm not I'm not a brave climber. I, I like to protect the climbs as I go. And um, I'm, yeah, I'm relatively cautious. And uh, well, it's certainly worked so far. I, I have, um, I've had as many injuries just from overuse as I have from actually having my oh, yeah. fall. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We heard of so many epic falls or dangerous falls and uh, yeah, it, it happens, unfortunately. I guess it comes with risk as well. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then whatever we can control. Are people more surprised when your hobby, um, with your hobby because of your age or because you are a woman? Very good question. Um, well, they're usually too polite to say. <laughs> I, I don't know if they if they think. I, I remember just just thinking of injuries and that I, I had some injury when I was in my early forties, and I went to um, a physiotherapist uh, for for an assessment and for advice, and she said. Uh, and I was running a lot of the time too. She said, and do you not think at your age that you should be giving up these activities? Well, I didn't go back to her, but um, to, in terms of, of age, yeah. I mean, people are surprised that I would still be an active rock climber and ice climber at my age, but um, most people, Most people who aren't climbers understand so little about it that it's not, it doesn't come up. From Claire, what has been your most challenging climb ever and why? Uh, yeah, um, well, pro probably, let me think. Um, well, there was one climb I did in the Alps uh, during my second season, uh, the, the Friend au Spur uh, on the Aiguille du Midi um, above Chamonix. And... Uh, it, it looked easy in the guidebook, it looked easy in the photograph and the conditions were really, really bad. And my climbing partner and I, we spent uh, too long on uh, the isoret, which was, is the main part of the climb mm -hmm. and it was in very bad condition. We couldn't get any proper belay for a couple of hundred meters. And we knew that if either of us slipped off uh, they would pull the other person off and um, there was bad snow first and then it turned into bad ice and it got steeper. Uh, in good conditions it's not at all technically difficult mm -hmm. but the conditions were horrible and uh, we, f for, f it, it was very stressful because we didn't, we were just so concerned that the whole thing would, would, the crest of snow we were on would collapse and that that would be it. So that was really scary for for quite a long time and that, that really burnt into my memory, even though it was a long time ago. I think you wrote about this climb in your book, in your... From me. What advice would you give to young women climbers? Um, I think maybe to not... Not to doubt yourself. I think women in particular tend to doubt themselves more than men. I'm generalizing here now, but I think men and women climb very differently. Mm -hmm. Now I climb slowly and carefully and cautiously. And it seems to me that men climb more impulsively and more quickly and they go for it. And I think that's just not women's way. And to just go with what feels right for you and, um, and it's normal to doubt yourself. And you'll surprise yourself too by what you're capable of if you mm -hmm. give yourself the chance. Question is from Sandra. 
uh, can you recommend some classic climbs you have done and would you love to repeat anywhere in the world? Your favorite, um, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 pretty broad. <laughs> um, uh, well, Al Alpine climbs, I would, I would, the ones I really enjoyed were the purely rock roots, I must say, and they, in Chamonix, they would come in grades from fairly straightforward to, to pretty challenging, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, and maybe something like um, the north face of the Peace Badil. It's one of the big north faces, but it's not a technically difficult climb, and it's not a terribly long climb. It was one that, that Calvin and I really enjoyed because it was the first alpine route that we did after Calvin recovered from breaking his ankles about 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. it was great to get out into, into onto the longer routes again. So that's that's a really enjoyable one. For for top class uh, trail climbing, I would say Red Rocks, Nevada, just outside Las Vegas, that's got hundreds and hundreds of fabulous climbs. That's that's really good. And that's, the, the United States is the only place where I've seen uh, women climbing together confidently, regularly, mm -hmm. and not quite outnumbering the men. And I'm not saying women should climb with women, of course not, but it, it is one place where, it's only in the States where I've seen among trad climbers, a huge number of women climbing as equals to men, climbing with other fem female partners or leading regularly with men. So mm -hmm. that's been really interesting. But apart from that, the climbing is, is great in Red Rocks. Um, also the last couple of winters, we've had trips to Morocco, to the Anti-Atlas Mountains, and that is really stunning. And um, there's loads of new routes to be done there as well, but really enjoyable climbing. Um, I'd certainly recommend Morocco, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just following the thread about the women climbing alongside men, what do you think about uh, women in Irish mountaineering and the perception of women still in, in the mountaineering, on the mountaineering scene? Well, if you could compare when you started and then how everything is um, looking now, um, yeah. What do you think? Is it easier for women now? Um, oh yeah, no, and... definitely. And the fact that women can, I mean, the, the, the immediate and most obvious difference for a beginner, beginner climbers, male or female, is that the male will definitely have upper body strength. And mm -hmm. the female, unless she is a gymnast or has a training background training like that, is, is going to find climbing just that bit um, harder, but climbing walls have made all the difference. Yeah. And women make, make great gains in power and strength when they train uh, on, on climbing walls. So, so that makes a huge difference, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't get over the, the, the difficulty of moving from indoors to outdoors. And the number of women who climb regularly, lead regularly as trad climbers is still relatively low compared to the number who climb indoors. But that's the case right through um, uh, mountaineering, alpinism, uh, if you're to generalize, because of course, trad climbing is the basis of all real yeah. mountaineering. I mean, we keep talking about climbing, but if you're talking about mountaineering as in having the skills to deal with Big, big steep mountains, the number of women who engage in that is still very, very small. And I think one indicator of that is um, the number of female guides. Uh, now the French guides, guiding in France is very well established. The, the company of guides of Chamonix, they were the first French, that was the first French guides association mm -hmm. to be set up. And that's going to be celebrating 200 years next year. It was 1821. But what percentage of French guides are female? 
two percent only two oh. percent uh, and i think i really think that is an indicator because to be a mountain guide an alpine guide you've got to be a very competent alpinist mm -hmm. and have a lot to spare to look after clients so yeah. that's that's a really really top class level of 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 skill confidence experience and only two percent i mean that is tiny and yeah. i think that's an indicator of the the small number of females still who engage in the very broad mountaineering the, in mountaineering with the very broad range of skills that are required with that and part of it is if she can't see she can't be I mean you just do not see you see you see female um, uh, sport climbers of course fabulous athletes and you see some female climbers climbing bolted routes in the Alps but if you're talking about the full-on alpine experience or the full-on big mountain experience there's there are almost no women I think it's really difficult even if young women are very mo motivated to continue climbing it, once they have children if they have children unless their partner is equally involved and of course obviously Calvin and I had that then it's it's very difficult to take time away from the family and climbing does take time yeah. it's not like a quick run or going off for a two-hour cycle you're talking about whole days or weekends yeah. or trips away so that's very, very difficult. And then if you've taken most of the nine months of the pregnancy or let's say eight months away from climbing, especially away from trad climbing, it's, it's going, you need to be quite motivated to get back to it. Mm -hmm. Many people uh, take climbing as a hobby now. For you, it was your life. It is this life, your lifestyle, uh, right. devotion, the main thing that you breathe and yeah before um yeah so that's what i took from your book um yeah no amazing there are other stories that i would like to talk about changes and climbing through you know all the cultural religious changes and marrying calvin as well a uh, person of different religion and how it was perceived and travels up north i think that's all interesting and that's all in the book and I won't say anything more because some people maybe didn't uh, read the book yet, but it's fantastic. It's great. What's your view on the recent issues on Everest with all the queues to the summit? And it's a question from Claire. Well, I, I, I think it's just, it's just, you know, it's definitely not a mountain for mountaineers anymore and hasn't been since the big commercial expeditions have got going, which would be 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago now, when the uh, guiding companies began to proliferate and to, uh, to, to advertise widely what was on offer in climbing Everest. And they, they wooed uh, non-climbers, they, 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 made it available to people who were very fit and very determined to climb Everest, but people who were not mountaineers. It depends, of course, on how you define mountaineering and how you define a mountaineer. But for me, self-reliance has to be at the core of it. But these people are relying on mountain guides and Sherpas and support all the way. And other people to make decisions about this is the day you should try, this is the day you stay at this camp, this is how long you stay, you should come down and rest and so on. So that's not mountaineering as I would see it. It's high altitude tourism and uh, Everest hasn't been a place for mountaineers for a long time. So it's, it's something different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's something that certainly I'd have no interest in. It might be controversial, uh, controversial for many people to hear your point of view, um, but I think it's a very valid one, and especially with the things that's going on on Everest now, 
And Ryu, is there a link to Ricky's recording of that climb that you were talking about? I think there is, and I think... Oh, yes, that's um, yeah. Ricky's film, um, Through yes. the Green Door. Through yes, the Green Door, yeah. He he filmed he filmed Michelle O'Loughlin doing mm -hmm. um, a hard head point in in the Grey Man's Path just around the corner just around the buttress and then he came he came across also and uh, and and filmed me and then edited them together yeah he he has produced some really good films mm -hmm. yeah yeah. So uh, the films are available and I think uh, Mountaineering Island posts uh, some as well on their uh, Facebook page. So if anybody would like to go back on the post, it should be there. But um, if you email me or Claire, uh, we might make it more available or even Rick Bell himself. And Ricky Patrick, what's the most uh, scared you have been ever on the roads and did it affect you afterwards in any way? Well, yeah, it's that friendo again. I think now I've had other really scary situations in the mountains, but I think the length of time that we were on the friendo on that section, it shouldn't have taken that long, but the con because conditions were so bad and because we were being so careful, it took hours and mm -hmm. Being in fear of your life for hours is pretty horrible. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, when I when I fell into a slot, a, a crevasse in a, a glacier in the Himalayas, that was pretty traumatic. But it was probably only for only about half an hour. Uh, whereas the, the the situation on the Frendo seemed to go on and on, and it really affected my confidence on snow I must say and mm -hmm. it came back to me in the Himalayas a few years later when I was descending on some steep-ish snow that was in bad condition and uh, the people around me were saying oh we'll, we'll put away the rope now we'll, we'll just we'll just go on down and I was saying to Calvin no no keep the rope on I'm going to turn around and face in and go down slowly otherwise I just, you know, it's just too much of a risk to take. So that 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 really stuck with me. And after that, we we were on an expedition in in the Andes in Peru, and the snow was not in great condition there either. I must say, and I wasn't that keen to go to to experience that type of uh, unconsolidated snow again. And but then. I, I did, obviously, I managed it in the Alps lots of times in between. But then more recently, maybe around 2000, we started ice climbing, um, frozen waterfalls in, in France uh, in winter. And that was great. That was really solid. Um, that, that was like, almost like rock climbing. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, soft, horrible snow is something I have yet to get over. Okay, okay, perfect. Have you ever done any solo climbing? Many trot climbers I have read about have the habit of doing easy soloing or at least easy for them as mental training. Yeah, I, I would have I would have soloed I would have soloed in Doki Quarry and in the Burren easy st easy enough stuff, but I don't anymore. Uh, you, you get to a stage when you realize that, well, certainly that you're not immortal, but also, if, if, if I have a slip, if I hurt myself, I know it'll take me longer to get back in shape again. So I don't anymore. It's just not worth mm -hmm. it. From Bart, um, they're saying that there are good climbers, but they die young, and there are not bad climbers who grow old. What do mm -hmm. you think about this? And what is your recipe to be mature and a good climber? Bart also says, adds, uh, I think the phrase might be old uh, versus bold and not good uh, versus not bad. So what do you think? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm, I, climb, I climb cautiously, but also you always need good judgment. Um, 
and you need good luck. I mean, there, there were lots of occasions in the Alps and that, that Calvin and I, we turned back. We didn't, we didn't continue on whatever our objective was because conditions weren't right. Um, you have to be ready to turn back. And, but apart from that, there's a lot of luck involved as well, especially in something like Alpine or Himalayan climbing when there's a lot of, uh, a lot of objective dangers beyond your control. But um, yeah, taking care and not being impulsive, not being reckless and being lucky. Yeah, yeah. It, okay, all, it so, all adds up. <laughs> yeah, so Andrew K Kirkpatrick uh, just added uh, the great quote, there are old climbers and bold climbers, but there are no old bold climbers. <laughs> well, you could say that. <laughs> What has been your most memorable or influential climb? Um, well, pr probably my first VS, and I write about that in the book as well, because that was that was a huge deal for me. Um, leading my first VS, it's it would be like somebody leading their first E4 now. VS was was uh, it, it was what separated the real climbers from the dabblers, if you could, and you had to lead, you had to be able to lead it. Yeah. Um, so, and I didn't know if I could, I didn't know if I could without falling. And if I fell, was I going to hurt myself? All of those unknowns and dealing with the, the tension and the fear that comes with that and, and doing it. Um, funny, I went back to that climb last week and it wasn't quite the way I remembered it at all. Mm. Anyway, um, it, it, I, I, I got up to a certain point, I mean, a few moves, it's short, a few moves, and looked down to see could I retreat. Oh, I was too high, I couldn't retreat, so I had to go on, and it was okay. I, I did the moves, and uh, I, I didn't run out of strength, and I was delighted with myself. And that euphoria, that feeling of having surpassed myself, that was unbelievable and unforgettable. So that was my most unforgettable climb, really, uh, way back in 1973, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the longest, not the longest, not the hardest, but uh, kind of breakthrough. Great question from uh, Max. Are your sons really proud of you or uh, do they take it all in their stride? Uh, do they worry about uh, what you do? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, they took it all in their stride because they didn't know anything else. They didn't know any better. And they, okay, while, they're, while their friends' parents didn't climb, they, we were constantly going away at weekends and meeting up with, with other climbers who had children of their own so you know they could see their people do this and families do go away together and then um and they're 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 very proud they're very proud of both of us and one of our sons when he he only between one thing and another only got around to reading my book about three weeks ago and he 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 sent me a message and he said i never realized it was so dangerous so you know <laughs> They, they, they just took it in their stride, but they didn't get persuaded into climbing themselves. Mm -hmm. they, they, they never never particularly got interested in that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, because they were present their whole life uh, yeah. in climbing, and that's really interesting. From Nick, uh, how did you find linking climbing and teaching? Teaching is still such a reserved and mainstream profession. As a climber who is usually more willing to rope it and adventure, how did you merge such different parts of Irish society? Um, I think I think climbing and teaching go very well together, really, because you've got a lot of time off. Now, you 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 work for it. You work mm -hmm. extremely hard, and you have to work outside of school hours. But you do have the summer. Um, which is a great stretch of time, um, a matter of months, whether you're primary or second level. And uh, yeah, I, I found they went really well. And I found that if, 
if I had spent the weekend climbing and had managed climbs that I felt were difficult for me and took, took courage, I suppose, and sticking power, there was nothing going to come up during my working week that I didn't feel that I could manage. I think, I, I think climbing, um, successes in climbing, um, building up confidence through climbing, I think that does have an effect on, um, on uh, other aspects of your life. And while teaching might not seem to be demanding in that, day, in that way, um, oh, you, you would never know when there could be, it, it, it's, it's, it's a stressful job. It's stressful in a whole lot of different ways um, and quite emotionally demanding. And um, sometimes you, 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 know, you, you find, oh, you might find uh, uh, a parent suddenly appearing at your door saying, you said this, or you didn't say this, and you think, oh, right, okay, we'll discuss this now. And um, I think, I think all, of, all, all through my teaching career, I think my climbing was a really good background support in a way, psychologically. Mm -hmm. Enormous pleasure, Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you for um, Thank you very much answering Anna. all our questions. And uh, we all have been honored, and I have been honored with fantastic audience as well. And um, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Enjoy Thanks your evening. For registering. Thanks very much, Anya. <laughs>